Hello and welcome. Um, we're going to just get started here, but I'm Jenna Oliver. I am the Director of Development for Ocean First Institute, and I want to welcome all of you to this cool webinar. We're looking today at Sex in the Sea. So uh, love is in the air in June, and today we're going to be talking with Dr. Mickey McComb Kobza and Dr. Mara Hart um, for an engaging romp beneath the waves to explore the wild and wondrous ways animals get down to business in the sea. So um, let me go ahead and introduce our executive director, Dr. Mickey McComb Kobza. Um, Dr. Mickey is one of the world's premier shark experts and our executive director and um, is a tireless advocate for the ocean and all of the creatures in it. So um, that's a very brief <laughs> description of what Mickey does. Mickey holds a PhD in integrated biology. Do I have that right, Mickey? Um, and you know, has worked years and years um, learning about and advocating for the ocean, um, its imperiled species and their habitats. And I'm gonna let her introduce Dr. Hart. So without further ado, Sex and the Sea with Ocean First Institute. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Jenna, for um, the introduction. I'm so excited to be here today um, with uh, Dr. Mara Hart. Uh, she is a friend of mine, and I am so happy to see you, and I'm happy and thrilled to have you here with us to talk about Sex in the Sea. It's so great and so fun. Um, so I'm just gonna intro you here a little bit. So you, uh, Dr. Mara Hart is currently the Director of Discovery at the nonprofit Future of Fish. Um, she works to identify solutions to the global overfishing crisis that focuses on helping small scale fishers continue to make a living while leaving enough fish for the future. It's, an, it's such important work. Uh, prior to her work with Future of Fish, she spent five years as the founder of Ocean Inc, working as a consultant investigating coral reef health, fishery impacts, and ocean acidification. She was also a research fellow at Blue Ocean Institute, where she launched their climate change program as if she doesn't have more things to do, including an initiative to engage scientists and religious leaders in constructive conversation about halting climate change. Um, she's a book writer. Her first book, Sex in the Sea, which we're going to hear about, combines the timeless topic of sex with the timely issue of ocean conservation and was an Oprah Magazine book pick. Um, she's an engaging speaker, as you're going to find out in just a second. She's given keynotes um, and conferences, public venues. Uh, she's been interviewed by Canada's Quirks and Quarks. I've been on that show, too. That's a good one. <laughs> uh, Stuff to Blow Your Mind podcast. Um, she's given a TED Talk. Uh, she's amazing. Uh, she received her PhD in marine science from Scripps Institute, uh, Institution of Oceanography in 2007, BA in History of Science from Harvard. Uh, Mara is married with children, living in Hawaii. She's living the dream. Uh, and she's absolutely an unstoppable force of nature. And uh, Mara, we are so thrilled to have you. We're honored to have you here with us today. And uh, without further ado, please uh, go ahead and take it away. Well, thank you so much. I'm gonna have to have you do all my introductions. <laughs> Mickey. That was awesome. Really appreciate it. And it's super, um, I'm really honored that you asked me to, to speak to everybody today. I love the work, obviously, that you're leading over at Ocean First Institute. So thank you for, for this invite and for giving me the chance to share on my favorite subject, which is <laughs> sex in the sea. So I'm um, really looking forward to, to discussing some of these ideas with everybody. But to jump in, uh, let's move right into the, into the talk. So I'm going to share screen now. And all right, and I'm going to go to slideshow. Let me know if this is coming up OK for everybody. Yeah, it looks great, Mara. Looks great. Excellent. Excellent. Great. So I'm going to talk today about fish sex and animal sex in the ocean, why it's weirder than we may think, and why that matters. So to kick it off, I'm going to ask you all to sort of close your eyes for a minute and just picture the ocean, wherever you are. And now consider that beneath that beautiful blue shimmering surface, millions and millions of fish are having sex right now. And the way they're doing it and what the strategies that they're using looks nothing like what we tend to see on land. 
An example of that are parrotfish. So in this species, this is a Caribbean species, all the individuals are born female. Then later in life, they'll start to grow. They have this coloration. And when they get to the right size and when the right social cues kick in, she will transition into a male. And she'll look like this. So it's quite a shift, but it's not just an external color change. Within a few weeks, her body will reabsorb her ovaries and grow testes in their place. It's pretty impressive. And it's also pretty common. In fact, I bet most of you have sat down to a seafood dinner, if you eat seafood, and had a species that actually started life as one sex and then transitioned to another. Some common examples of that. I'm trying to go to the next slide. Uh, oh, there we go. Common examples of that include oysters, grouper, and yes, shrimp. So sex change in the sea is very, very common, but it doesn't always go from female to male. So those uh, clownfish, those beautiful, cute little clownfish that we're all very familiar with from the movie Finding Nemo, right? They're all born male. And then later in life, they will transition into female. So a little bit of a, a spoiler alert here. In the real world, when Nemo's mom died, his dad, Marlin, would have actually transitioned into Marlene and Nemo would have likely mated with his father turned mother. <laughs> so you can see why Disney took a little bit of creative license with the plot line, right? This is, a, this is not always a, a G-rated strategy, but it's a strategy that animals use in the ocean very commonly. The question is why? This takes energy, right? To transition and change over all your sexual organs is a huge investment. Why would a species do it? The answer is to maximize their reproductive output. In the case of Nemo, here's what's going on. Unlike in humans, where females are born with all the eggs we will ever have, and that number actually goes down over time. This is a case for mammals. In fish, the opposite occurs. The larger the fish, the more eggs she can produce and carry. So over time, as she grows, her number of eggs grow. And so for a female who doubles in size, turns out that she doesn't just double her eggs. She can um, increase that number exponentially. We call these large females boffs, big, old, fat, fecund female fish. And they're really important for our population's um, reproductive survival over time. And in clownfish, which mate in pairs, and they stay mated in pairs throughout one or the other's lifetime, it makes sense for the female to be the largest, because that's how that couple is going to maximize the number of eggs it's producing. So in clownfish, they start as males. When they're small, that small male still has enough sperm to fertilize all the eggs of the bigger female. But in other fish, like the parrotfish that we saw earlier, they don't mate in pairs. They actually form harems. And to be in a harem, a male has to be really big to be able to defend his females or defend a territory in which the females live. So a small male wouldn't really be able to mate. He wouldn't be able to control that resource. So instead, in that species, it makes sense for them to be born female and they can mate when they're small. The females can mate with a larger male. And then once she's big enough and has the potential to form and take over her own harem, she can transition into that male status and become an alpha male who can defend and compete with other males and then fertilize the eggs of all the females in her, now his new harem. So it all comes down to the type of mating strategy these animals have and which direction and whether sex change makes sense. 
So it's a fascinating occurrence. And fish are one of the only vertebrates where we see this ability to change sex. And it particularly happens in marine fish versus even freshwater fish. Okay, so let's see if we can go now. I don't know why it's not clicking through easy here. All right, so sex change in the sea is fascinating, but it's also only one of the strategies that animals reproduce, use to reproduce in the ocean. And let, trust me when I tell you that it's one of the least surprising. There are so many wonderful and wild ways that animals choose to have sex and make uh, the next generation. It is a fascinating subject, but it's also a really important subject. So why today should I take your time and should we be discussing sex in the sea at all? And the answer is because sex is what drives all of the abundance and all of the biodiversity that we all depend on in the ocean. So today, over 3 billion people on the planet rely on seafood for a significant and essential part of their diet and nutrition. We depend on millions and millions of oysters and corals to build the reefs that protect our coastlines from rising seas and storms. We rely on new medicinals from a huge diversity of marine life to create new drugs and compounds that help us fight things like cancer and heart disease. So we really depend on the oceans for resources that provide value to us as well as for our own spiritual and recreational and cultural benefit. In order for us to keep benefiting from all of this abundance and diversity of the ocean, the fish and corals and shrimp of today have to be able to make the fish and corals and shrimp of tomorrow. And to do that requires lots and lots of sex. So we need these animals to be reproducing. The challenge is that reproduction in the ocean is really hard to study. And until recently, we weren't able to get to know what some of these strategies are. Getting under the sea to see these things, they're fast, they're fleeting in time. Sometimes they only happen once a year. But luckily, we have some new technology and new science that's helping us sort of lift the veil on these intimate acts. And in the recent uh, decade especially, there's two things that these studies have started to show. The first is that sex in the sea is really funky. No doubt, it is bizarre. The second thing though is that we are wrecking havoc on the sex lives of these marine life, from shrimp to salmon. And I know that can seem surprising. How could we be impacting these intimate acts that happen so far from land? But we're starting to learn that we have a greater reach than we've realized. So today I'm going to walk you through a couple of my favorite examples of how animals do it in the deep, how we're interrupting these acts, and what we can do to start to change that. So remember those sex-changing fish, those parrotfish we were talking about? Okay. So in many places in the world, we have rules that help protect species so that they can grow and reproduce. So when it comes to fishing, there are rules that often set a minimum catch size so that fishers cannot target baby fish. This gives them the chance to grow and reproduce <clears throat> before they're caught, which is a good thing. But when we think about those sex changing populations like a parrotfish that goes from female to male, if we're only targeting the biggest fish, then we're taking out all of the males. And that can be a problem. That means that we might be leaving enough fish in the ocean, but we've now skewed the sex ratio. That makes it harder for females to find mates and to effectively reproduce. That results in fewer fish babies in the future. Now, there are ways that we could change this. We could create new types of strategies, new types of regulations if we know we're dealing with a, a, fish chain, a sex changing population such as setting a maximum size limit in addition to a minimum one. It's not that we don't have the tools and ability to think of sex-friendly strategies. The challenge we face is knowing which strategies to apply to which species, because even some animals that we're really familiar with surprise us when it comes to their sex lives. Maine lobster is one of my favorite examples of this, right? 
They don't look very romantic. <laughs> they definitely don't look that kinky, but they are both. So in the case of lobsters, the best time for them to mate is right after the female has molted. This is because at the base of her shell, she holds um, a small area, a receptacle, where males can insert and store their sperm. Now, when she molts, that receptacle gets tossed off with her old shell. She wants to mate with a male and have that receptacle be filled up to the brim so that she then can go off, do her thing, and she can draw upon that storage of sperm over multiple cycles where she can fertilize her eggs and she doesn't have to worry about mating again. For the male, he wants to be able to mate with a freshly molted female because he wants to be able to have a brand new receptacle that he can fill up all with his own sperm and not have to mix his sperm with another male's who might have mated with her previously. So both of them want to mate right after she's molted. The problem is males during mating season, male lobsters, are incredibly aggressive. They are total brutes and they will attack any lobster that approaches their den, male or female. Meanwhile, the female is in her most vulnerable state after she's molted. She's lost her hard shell. She's soft in her body. So she has to figure out a way to approach these males, a super aggressive male, while she's completely exposed. What does she do? Well, it turns out <laughs> she sprays him in the face repeatedly with her urine. Pee is a very, very powerful love potion in the sea. And so luckily or conveniently for lobsters, their bladders sit just above their brains and they have two nozzles under their eye stalks with which she can shoot her urine forward. So she approaches the male's den, she peeks around the corner and as that male charges out, she sprays him in the face with her urine and then she gets the hell out of there. She does this over a couple of days. And during that time, the chemical signature of her urine starts to have a transformative effect over the male. He turns from an aggressive to a gentle lover. And by the week's end, he'll invite her and only her into his den. They will live there for a couple of days doing their lobster thing, hunting, hanging out. And then when it's time to mate, or time for her to molt, excuse me, and mate, she will go around and face him. They will stand um, sort of facing one another. And again, they will start dosing each other with their pee. And she then gives him a very clear message. He will bow down, putting his big claws into the sand. And she sort of rises up and she'll take one claw and she taps him on one shoulder and then the other. Scientists have called this knighting, and it really does look like that. And it's a clear signal from her to say, I'm about to molt, stay put, because all of this is all gonna happen in the next you know, couple hours, don't go anywhere. She then goes to the back of the den, takes her a little bit of time to slip out of her old shell. The male guards the den during this time. He then will walk over to her, and he will sort of stroke her with his antenna and his small walking legs. And he has taste buds on the bottom of his feet. So those walking legs, he's actually sort of tasting her and, and stroking her very gently while she's sort of recovering from the molt. Then when she's ready, he will brace himself with his big claws in the sand and his tail. And then he uses his small walking legs to pick her up, roll her onto her back, and then pull her into him. And then belly to belly, in a standard missionary position, they will mate. After the mating, which only takes a few seconds, he then gently lays her back down on the floor, and then he will guard the entrance of the den over the next few days while her new shell forms and hardens around her. Then, once she's ready, she says, thanks so much, and off she goes. She'll leave the den, and they likely will never see each other again. The male then receives probably in another day or two, the next female at his doorstep, who will start to spray him in the face with her urine again. And the whole cycle continues because lobsters are serial monogamists. <laughs> so it's a very complex and beautiful ritual that allows these lobsters to mate safely with one another. And it all depends 
on this really critical chemical signal. Which raises the question, how in the world can we be interrupting this uh, kind of kinky affair? The answer is by changing the chemistry of seawater. So with climate change, by putting so much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, the oceans have had to absorb more of that gas. And when carbon dioxide mixes with seawater, it creates a chemical reaction which is changing the chemistry of the ocean. It's actually making the oceans more acidic. The chemical signal in the female lobster's urine works because it can travel through seawater and it can, um, and the lobsters have receptors that can receive that chemical message and interpret it. By changing the chemistry of seawater, we may be making it more difficult for that signal to travel as well as it can damage the lobster's smell receptors. In both cases, this could make it harder for the female to um, have this effect over the male. And can you imagine what the impact would be if she's not able to use that love potion to seduce her mate? These are the kinds of subtle yet significant impacts we're having on the sex lives of these marine life. And it's not just climate change. Pollution and other types of inputs that we're putting into the ocean that scramble or introduce new toxins or, or chemicals can have the same effect. And it's hard for us to understand this, right? Because this is not how we necessarily reproduce. But it's really important that we um, start to recognize that these interactions among animals in the oceans are different and very diverse, so that we can start to better anticipate what our own impacts may be. This is especially true when we dive a little bit deeper. And oh, sorry, here was my ocean chemistry slide. So sh showing a representation of ocean acidification. But diving deeper, sex starts to look even stranger, if you can imagine. This is a picture of a fan-tailed anglerfish. And this was taken um, just a few years ago. I think it was 2015 or 2016. When we had the first live video recording of this um, um, a mated pair of this species. So, fan tail anglerfish are fascinating because the males are born without the ability to feed. In order for them to survive, they have to find a female fast. To do so, the males have a very strong sense of smell. And so he hunts through the pitch black waters searching for a female, kind of smelling his way to her. Meanwhile, the female who is 10 times or more bigger than the male sends out this very strong pheromone, sort of a perfume, to attract mates to her. So the male is swimming through these waters and when he finds the female, he gives her a love bite. And this is when things start to get really strange. That bite triggers a chemical reaction between the male and the female, whereby the male's jaw bones start to dissolve and his face begins to fuse with her body's flesh. Their circulatory systems entwine and all of the male's internal organs start to dissolve except for his testes. His testes actually begin to mature and they start producing sperm. So in the end, the male, who you can see here at the bottom of, of the slide, is basically a permanently attached on-demand sperm factory for the female. It's quite a convenient system <laughs> in that now the female has a mate and the male has a mate in these big pitch black dark waters where it can be hard to find a mate and they can use each other's eggs and sperm when needed. But this is a really strange system, right? I mean, this is not the kind of thing that we see on a farm. <laughs> and in order for us to know that these things exist, we have to, uh, in order to know our impacts, we have to know that these kind of systems can exist so that we can better anticipate how we may be affecting the outcome of sexual reproduction in the sea especially in the deep. 
just a few years ago, in fact, we discovered a new species of octopus that lives and lays her eggs on rocks that, on sponges that attach to rocks at over two miles down in the ocean. Right now, however, there are companies that are building bulldozers to harvest these rocks from the seafloor. The rocks contain rare earth minerals. But these bulldozers can't discriminate. So they would harvest the rocks with all the sponges and all the eggs attached with it. We didn't even know this species existed. So in many cases, knowingly and unknowingly, we are affecting the ability for these animals to reproduce in the ocean. And we need to take a new stance if we are going to be able to ensure that life in the sea can continue to thrive and selfishly that we can continue to benefit from all of the amazing resources that the oceans give us. So this is going to demand that we approach the oceans like any relationship with a slightly different um, attitude and slightly different actions. So we need to start to not think of the oceans as just something that's out there beyond reach, right? That we can't affect. Instead, we need to recognize that we are intimately connected with the sea, no matter where we live. And that level of intimacy demands that we start to treat the oceans and consider our own actions in a new way. And there are several different things that we can do. So, as we think about our impacts on the oceans, we can think about the different ways that we do interact directly or indirectly. When it comes to seafood, we can consider how we can start to support sex-friendly seafood. So these are species that live lower on the food chain and reproduce more quickly. So things like oysters and mussels and clams, small fish like mackerel, sardines, they reproduce really, really quickly and with the right management, they can withstand a bit of fishing pressure. We can also be asking for what we like to call storied fish. So at Future of Fish, a lot of the work we do is to help make sure that the fishers who are fishing responsibly and the, the fisheries that are well managed can be traced so that as a consumer, we know that we are sourcing from a reliable and responsible fishery. That requires that we ask for information. Where did this fish come from? How was it harvested? When was it harvested? If you can't get answers to those questions, choose a different species. There are many options out there, and there are some really good guides that are now available to help us all choose our seafood more wisely, and I'm happy to um, provide more information during the question and answer session. Supporting local fisheries also is a great um, way to help support sex-friendly fisheries, because here in the US, we actually have very strong um, fisheries policies. So if you live in a country like the USA, Australia, Europe, where there are strong measures in place, New Zealand is another example, then you can feel good about sourcing from your local fisheries. If you don't know, reach out and start to ask. We can also rethink what we use to wash our bodies, clean our homes, and care for our lawns. All of those chemicals wash down the drains and eventually make their way out into the ocean and can disrupt the natural chemistry of the sea. So look for ways that you can reduce the water and chemical usage in your own homes. It's better for your own health as well as that of ocean life. Industry also has to take a role in this and take a precautionary approach protecting the sex lives and the breeding practices where we know they exist and avoiding harm in the cases where we just don't yet know enough. And this is especially true for the deep sea. So we need industry to be far more proactive and precautionary when it comes to the types of activities that are being conducted in our world's oceans. And finally, in the places where we work, in the communities where we live and the country in which we vote, we must act on climate change now. 
This means advocating for and supporting representatives who respect the use of science in decision making and are pushing forward bold action on climate change. Never has it been more important nor more possible to support the solutions that we already know exist. But we have to act now for the coral orgies that need to happen around the world, for lobster sex lives, we must make sure that they have the right temperature and chemistry in order to allow for their sex lives to thrive and thrive and for reproduction to happen. The good news is that nature is on our side here. This challenge can feel overwhelming, but actually animals are working with us to move this all forward. Mickey, this is a, especially for you. This is a case, a wonderful case of a soft, small tooth sawfish. So this is a relative of a shark. And this species is an endangered species. And I bring this as an example of how much life works to make reproduction happen, even under really extreme circumstances. As an endangered species, um, the small tooth sawfish doesn't encounter mates very often. But a few years ago, researchers um, were able to tag a female. And as they were tagging this female, they found that she actually started to give birth right on the line. And in this upper right picture, you can see the researchers holding, this female is now flipped on her belly. And right here, you can start to see where the baby's small little rostrum, this little saw, is coming out of the female's cloaca. So she's starting to give live birth. And down below, you'll see a picture of this cute, perfectly formed little sawtooth um, coming out and how, how beautiful they are. This event was a really rare occasion where researchers were able to actually get a genetic sample from the mom and all of her babies. They wanted to see whether or not the female was mating with one or multiple males. So again, trying to get a sense of what the strategy, the mating strategy is for this endangered species. When they ran the DNA and did the tests, turns out what they found was there was no male DNA. There was no dad. This female had reproduced all on her own through a, 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 a strategy called parthenogenesis, and it's virgin birth. It's an amazing process whereby a female's egg can split and refuse with itself to form a viable offspring. Now, in the long term, this kind of reproduction cannot save a species. They, all species need to have the genetic diversity that happens through actual sex, through males and females reproducing, two individuals mixing their genes in order to survive. But by reproducing on her own, this female is contributing more numbers to the population which can help buy a population some time and give us a chance to continue to put in rules and regulations that can help protect and help a species to recover. So nature wants to reproduce <laughs> even under extreme circumstances and we'll find a way to do so. So I leave you with this thought, which is imagine if instead of working against this tremendous force in nature, we worked with it. Imagine if we just took a step back and allowed the fish and shrimp and corals and whales of today to do what they do best and get their spawn on. No more interference and instead put in rules and practices and behaviors on our part that allow them just to do what they're all working so hard to do every day anyway. We could help bring back so many of these species. The potential is all there. Every day out beneath the ocean, these animals are actively reproducing. We have very few extinctions in the ocean, which means all the potential for rebirth and renewal is still with us. So it is with that thought that I will leave you and thank all of the amazing scientists whose work contributes to my ability to tell these stories 
hearts and bring this message apart. And um, I'm happy to take questions and uh, move into, yeah, move into hearing your thoughts and, and um, your feedback. Thank you, Dr. Hart. Um, just a couple of questions um, that have come in. Where, when you were talking about the measures that we could take to help species thrive, um, how, where can we get fish sex friendly seafood guides? Yeah, so there are, are several different guides that um, I can recommend. The, the first and foremost comes from the Monterey Bay Aquarium's Seafood Watch program. They uh, have a fantastic uh, system where they have researchers and scientists who peer review the status of fish to make sure that they are being harvested well. So it's fish and shellfish. Uh, it's mostly North American focused, but they are expanding. So that is one of the, the premier guides that I would recommend. There are other certifications that are also out there and other standards. Uh, Marine Stewardship Council, the MSC, is a logo that you can look for. It's a blue fish that are on packages. Fair Trade USA also certifies seafood, and they look at sustainability, environmental sustainability, as well as social practice. So that's another one that I can recommend to look for. If you live in another country, um, there are other standards that are in place. Um, the UK has its own. Um, there's ones uh, that are coming up in Asia now. Uh, so I would recommend looking online for the place where you live and searching for um, sustainable seafood guide or sustainable seafood certification. They also exist for aquaculture products too. So there is an equivalent of the Marine Stewardship Council for Aquaculture known as the ASC. There's also, um, which is aquaculture sustainability certification, I believe. I sometimes get the acronyms a little off. But um, lots of different um, certifications and ratings are out there. And if anybody is, is really interested in diving in detail, please feel free to shoot me an email and I can send you um, some reports that have come out on all of these certifications and, and ratings. And we'll try and share those resources on our website um, and with okay. our after. There's a couple of other questions. This one's a little bit detailed, but I'll just read it here. Hi, um, dear Dr. Mara, what an awesome interactive presentation. I'm Sam from Indonesia, and I just want to ask, do fishes that mated with several males, um, can they give birth to all of them, all of the sperms going in? Can in one birth, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read that. Can one birth come from several males? What about genetics? Thank you in advance. Yes, and so Mickey, I'm sure you could jump all over this because sharks are an amazing example, right? Um, but the answer is yes. So we, we do see, um, especially for, um, well, for both cases. So in the ocean, we have two main strategies of how reproduction happens. So you can have internal fertilization, similar to mammals. So all, all the marine mammals do this, you know, whales, um, dolphins, uh, walrus, and you have external fertilization where fish, um, uh, oysters, others are releasing their eggs and sperm into the ocean. When they're releasing the eggs and sperm into the ocean and it's all mixing around, then absolutely you have different males' sperm coming in to mix with one female's output. With internal fertilization, it again, it'll depend on the species and their strategy. We do see in sharks that one female can be mated with um, multiple males within a season, and she can carry pups that are half siblings that have different dads. In other cases, the matings are, um, things get a little more complex and a little more funky, and certain males' um, sperm can win out. There are also species that can store sperm. So she may mate with multiple males and then actually kind of put, tuck that sperm away and then fertilize her eggs over time. And we're still trying to figure out whether or not she can sort of choose or select which sperm she's using and whether she's drawing from a male that she favors, whether she just draws from all of them to kind of um, not put all her eggs in one basket for a terrible pun. But yeah, it's, it really can, can depend. So Mickey, I don't know if you have any specific examples that you think would be, would be cool to share, but yeah. 
Yeah, uh, you know, um, lemon sharks have been studied on multiple paternity. And so that's a really fascinating one. But the thing that I think is really exciting is the storage of sperm. And again, going to what you said, the females, do they selectively choose which sperm um, we don't know what that mechanism is, but the storage of sperm itself, can we don't know how long, is that indefinite? How do they keep the sperm alive and viable? That in itself is a marvelous thing to study and to try to understand um, the viability of the sperm. If they're storing it for months at a time, how does that work? And then yeah. there's also weird, uh, in, especially in insects, there are, there are weird um, shapes, uh, keyhole almost to uh, male organs and females, and males will carve out other sperm from other males before they uh, insert theirs. I mean, there is like a war going on, an arms race of storing Absolutely. sperm in females, and it's fascinating. It's it is, fascinating. It is, it is really, really cool. And that actually reminds me, one of, one of the most, I think, jaw-dropping pieces of, of the research that when I was writing the book was from whales. And so there, so the right whale is not the largest whale on the planet, but it has by far the largest testes, both proportionally and in size. They are a half ton each. So one male has a t literally ton of testes. That's gigantic. And again, not only is it impressive, but it's a huge energy yeah. resource, right? Like, why would an animal in invest in this? And it turns out that right whales are very promiscuous. They will have sex all throughout the year, even when the females can't get pregnant. <laughs> and they have lots of, lots of sex with each other. And in fact, it's the one case that we have actually witnessed. Some, some researchers, again, were observing these whales. And they actually saw two males simultaneously insert into a female one on each side of her were able to bring their very dexterous um, large phalluses and insert at the same time that is the ultimate level of sperm competition so you're not just competing with a male who may have gotten to a female before you you are now competing with a male literally at the same time having more volume of sperm wow. is one way of trying to Make sure that you get more of your sperm in there than somebody else. And so while these things seem just like crazy, amazing bar trivia facts, they also make sense when you look at this, this race and this competition that's happening for, for animals to want to get the most offspring out there as possible during their lifetime. So the answer to the question is, Yes, multiple paternity can happen. And yes, there's a lot of fascinating things that are going on in terms of how these animals have evolved because of the, the drive to, to maximize that reproduction and because of the competition that occurs um, for these different mating strategies. Yeah, and you know, one other thing that I think is worth remarking about is um, if, you, if any of the viewers have not read this book, read Richard Dawkins' The Selfish Gene to try to understand that path and the reason why genes are so um, selfish and try yeah. to pass on um, genes through, through time. So it's, it's a wonderful- That is a great. Really, really good one. Um, I have, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, um, I have one other Speaking question. of evolution, and then, um, you know, do we have enough data, Dr. Hart, do you think enough observation to determine if the mating strategy is changing with the climate and the chemistry of the ocean? It's a really, really good question. Um, <clears throat> there are some impacts that we have been able to document. Um, we have not had from what I've read, um, we have not had documentation of an evolved strategy, but what we are seeing is adaptations. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing um, for species that use um, certain types of temperature cues to, to bring on reproduction, they may be going deeper or farther, farther offshore. So their, their, their mating grounds are shifting to try to find that right um, uh, temperature cue. We're seeing issues like with salmon. Um, it's uh, a, a huge challenge. Like last year, I believe it was with sockeye. I think that's the right salmon that I'm, I'm remembering, but they, they were able to get back to um, the mouth of the rivers, 
but the rivers were so warm yeah. that the salmon actually didn't go up them to reach their spawning ground. So you had all these salmon pooling mm -hmm. at the mouths of the rivers that were ready to go to get, you know, to, to do their final hurl upstream, but they actually didn't, didn't go. And the ones who did go, the temperatures were so hot that it, it, um, it, it led to fatalities. Yeah. So we are seeing these, these impacts. Um, we have also seen in places that have had a lot of industrial pollution, um, strange and, and um, kind of abnormal sex change. So for animals that do go through a sex change process, we've seen, especially in some crustaceans, males and females with like hybrid um, genitalia that, that are not right. Um, so things are getting scrambled in terms of their ability to go through because so much of the sex change or all of the sex change process is, is a hormone driven. It's a chemistry driven process that these um, other chemicals in, in the environment have been impacting that. And again, we've seen that mostly near, near coasts and near areas where there's a lot of effluent and input from, from pollution. So we haven't yet seen, um, you know, uh, what I would call an, an evolution of a new mating strategy that we can say, well, you know, is, is, is a shift that a, an entire species is making. What we're seeing right now are populations responding and trying to adapt by changing behavior, mm -hmm. whether or not that is then trickling down again to genetic shifts that would be more on that evolutionary time scale, we don't know yet. Um, we do know though that fish populations can um, respond and evolve very quickly. So there are studies that have looked at, for example, size selective fishing, mm -hmm. where um, again, because larger fish are targeted over even just a 10 year period, they can show that fish actually within that species will start to reproduce at smaller sizes mm -hmm. because it's the risk of, of having to wait to grow older. They get take, you know, they get hit. So individuals that have a genetic advantage to reproduce at a smaller size are winning out. And so we, we know that they can have that level of response within a few years to a, a very strong um, targeted sort of uh, force that we're applying. So the potential is definitely there and some of the early signs are there. Thank you. Um, Mickey, did you have any other questions? I know there's one question I've kind of been saving for the end. Yeah, no, um, go, go for it. It's a great question. Yeah, Shannon um, asked, do you have any advice for high schoolers who want to pursue a career in the advancement of environmental sustainability? Yes, do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, so what I would say that I think is really encouraging is that there are so many different ways that you can have a career in environmental sustainability. Um, we need to solve these problems, to, to come up with a way to live on this earth in balance among our fellow species and with the physical nature that we all rely on, water cycles and oxygen cycles and all the rest. We have, these are complex systems. We need expertise in engineering and science and law and human behavior change and design and art and every discipline you can imagine could shape environmental sustainability long-term and solutions for it. So that's the first thing I wanna say is you don't have to be what we all think of as like a strict scientist or um, uh, you know, even you know, advocate. We all actually need in our careers and our passions to think about how we can harness our talents to help move the needle, to help make this change possible. What I would say though, on a more kind of less philosophical answer is definitely as you come out of high school, I actually think because of, kind of some of the, the, what I was just talking about, I actually think having a liberal arts education is really important. Being able to know what, what it is to you know, do, do law and policy, how regulations and management works is important. Being able to write well, 
Mm -hmm. so that you can articulate your ideas and express your ideas to a wide and diverse group of stakeholders is critical. Mm -hmm. Being able to understand history, know where we've come from, know the factors that contribute to how we got to where we are so that we don't repeat our mistakes and can actually move forward in a positive way, it, that matters. So I think it's important to stay diverse in the types of education and courses that you can take as an undergrad and then Focus in your grad school. If you want to continue to move through an academic path, you can do a master's or a PhD. That's where you can really focus and start to build your expertise and your content knowledge. But allow yourself the ability to have that broad foundation of how to think and how to problem solve before you narrow in. You're going to have the rest of your life to get to be the expert on whatever that focus is. So that would be that would be my advice. And there's some wonderful programs now on, again, yeah, environmental um, sciences, environmental policy. Um, they're all they're all really rich. But I would say go wide to start, and then narrow later. That is an amazing answer, and I, I couldn't <laughs> agree more. I think that's so um, critical. And and one thing that you do so well is you are an amazing storyteller. And I think that we people are storytelling animals and that really helps us connect and care. And uh, when we care is when we really act. And so I think uh, that's great advice. And uh, what an amazing talk. That was incredible. <laughs> the questions <laughs> were crazy good. Um, and we have definitely uh, overtaken our time. So uh, I just want to thank you, um, Dr. Mara Hart, for being with us today. This was absolutely a treat. Uh, thank uh, you. The pleasure was mine. I, yeah. I really appreciate being invited. And yes, please, folks, um, reach out, uh, check out the book. It's lots more fun and wild facts in there. And then, yeah, <laughs> let me know what you think. I'm always, always um, interested in I often get folks who are like, you didn't cover this, this species. It does this cool thing. And I love that because I, I need to collect more and more for sure. That'll be your second book. Yep. Yeah. Your book. <laughs> yeah. And thank you so much for all you do, Mickey and, and um, Jenna at uh, Oceans First. It's so, so important. And um, really, um, you're just helping move the needle on, on getting awareness and education out there for our amazing ocean. So I am, I am humbly in your service. Oh, thank you so much. Well, um, Jenna, thank you uh, for the intro and for taking all the questions. Um, thank you to all of our panelists and people that tuned in on Facebook Live. Um, thank you for taking time to be with us today and learning all about fish. And the lobster story blew my mind. It was absolutely <laughs> amazing. <laughs> Dang, incredible, right? Well, Change, changes what you might think of for your next, uh, you know, lobster yeah. bake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Incredible. Um, well, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, we will have this on Facebook Live and uh, we, you can watch it again and again if you want to, because I will. It was amazing. And thank you, Dr. Hart, for joining us again. I appreciate thank it. Thank you all. I will follow up and get more speakers from you. So thank you so much. Absolutely. And, everybody yeah. stay healthy. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. -bye. Bye.